Introducing Bluehost Cloud, ultra-fast WordPress hosting with 100% uptime. Want a website with unmatched power, speed, and control? Of course you do. And now you can have all three with Bluehost Cloud, the new web hosting plan from Bluehost. With 100% uptime and incredibly speedy load times, your WordPress websites will be dependable and lightning fast on a global scale. Plus, your sites can handle even the biggest traffic spikes without going down or lagging. And with Bluehost Cloud, you get 24-7 WordPress priority support, meaning you're connected to WordPress experts anytime you need them. Not to mention, you automatically get daily backups and world-class security. So, what are you waiting for? Get Bluehost Cloud today by visiting bluehost.com. That's bluehost.com. This episode is brought to you by Mac Weldon. Change your stocking stuffing underwear for a top-of-the-line gift. Mac Weldon's underwear, socks, and shirts look good, and they perform well. They're great for working out, going to work, going on dates, using in the lab, you know, all the things everyone does. The Mack Weldon Holiday Packs are available, and they're not just a great gift for the men in your life. They're a gift the men in your life need. Go to MacWeldon.com and get 20% off using promo code STORIES. That's MacWeldon.com, 20% off with promo code STORIES. A science story, huh? Scientist, they, I felt, felt I feel right. I was so and I just thought, well, I had figured it out. I it was that tall. golden moment because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week's story is from Adam Foote. It was recorded in October 2014 at the Rex Theater in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm an evolutionary biologist, and I specifically study uh, early development of different organisms. So, like, the kinds of things that an embryo has to figure out how to do really early on, like what's, what cells are going to be skin, what cells are going to be skeleton, what cells are going to become the mouth, all that stuff is really fascinating to me. And the, the organism, the, the creature that I study to learn all, about all of this is a sea urchin. Um, I don't know if everybody here knows what a sea urchin is. There's a bit of a cartoon of one on my shirt right now. <laughs> They do not have eyes or a cute little mouth like this. They're small, little, purple, spiky balls. Uh, And if you're just kind of like watching them in a tide pool or something, you would be perfectly, it would be perfectly reasonable for you to mistake them for like a plant or something. They don't move a whole lot. They don't do a whole lot. But their larvae, their little babies are just absolutely endlessly fascinating to me. They develop really quickly and they swim around and they eat and they uh, they grow these wonderful complex structures that like require massive coordination across the entire organism and that's that coordination is what I study so the only real problem with the sea urchin as my organism is that you can't breed them in captivity So I have to order them from somewhere else. I mean, they're a sea creature, so Pittsburgh isn't exactly near the ocean. Uh, So I have to have these sea urchins shipped in from San Diego. Um, Usually, uh, I just, I call these, this fishery up, they say, yep, they'll be there the next day. I come into lab the next day and there's this nice little box at my doorstep I open it up, I put the the sea urchins in their new seawater home. They're usually a bit grumpy from the travel, um, which can be kind of hard to tell what that means. Uh, But in general, the sea urchins express themselves in one of two ways. When they're they're not very comfortable with their surroundings, they'll either uh, start waving their spines around, trying to poke whatever is responsible for their discomfort, I assume. Or they will start spawning, which is when they release their eggs or sperm, depending on their gender. And uh, 
I, ass- I, I really don't know what they w- why they would think that this is a good idea. My assumption is that it, it's just like, well, I'm about to die. Might as well try to get stuff into the next generation. <laughs> so, but those, those, that's like, those are the reactions that they have. That's like it. That's all that they do when they're, when they're shipped to me. And, you know, I can usually alleviate this by like, I just put them in new seawater. I give them a little bit of uh, kelp or seaweed as a snack. They're, they're big fans of that. Um, and then they, they, uh, they'll be fine after a few hours of just kind of acclimating to their new environment. Well, my uh, story really begins just after Christmas vacation last year. Um, I had been gone for a few weeks, and so when I came back, I knew that I, I needed to get a new shipment of sea urchins in. Um, and so I, I called up the fishery, and they were, they were nice enough to inform me that, you know, early January is right in the middle of their normal spawning season, when they're normally, uh, uh, in the wild, they would be releasing their eggs and sperm around the beginning of January, and so this can be a bit of an issue. Um, When the sea urchins spawn, normally they just release some eggs and some sperm. But if they're really uncomfortable or grumpy or I I don't know what, if they feel like it, I guess, they'll release like everything that they have, all of their eggs and sperm. And we call that spawning out. And what they'll do afterwards is die. (laughs) They, they'll release everything that they've got and then just die. And it really is just that quick, too. Um, and so we've got, we, we might have an issue here is, as January is coming in, you know, they've been spawning in the wild, plus, you know, whatever grumpiness they might acquire from the travel, there's a chance that some of them might not be in great shape by the time they get to me. So to cover this, I was like, okay, Send me extra. Send me like 30 sea urchins instead of my normal 15. This will cover anything that might happen. If some of them end up not being okay, that's okay. I've got I've got extras. And so, I think I've got everything sorted out now. So I I go home happy that night. Well, the next morning I woke up and it was the first day of the polar vortex weather pattern. Uh, You know. Cars weren't starting, diesel fuel was freezing in buses, uh, my car's thermometer is apparently incapable of displaying negative numbers. <laughs> that, that, I learned something new that day. Uh, and so my first thought upon seeing this was, awesome, nobody's going to be on the roads, I can get to lab early. <laughs> Make sure that my urchins are, get into work safe and sound. And so I, I get to work, and, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready for the urchins to arrive. And, you know, noontime delivery time comes, and no urchins. Uh, the late night delivery comes, and no urchins. So I go home that night, and I think, you know, they, they, probably, they probably paid more attention to the weather than I did, and they waited until after the polar vortex to ship these urchins 2,000 miles across the country. So the next day I come in and, and assume, you know, they're going to arrive today. Well, the shipping times go by and still no urchins. So day three comes around and I come in in the morning and there they are. There's the box of urchins ready for me. All right, let's, let's, get, let's get these guys out of their box and into their new home. And I pick up the box and it's really cold. That was the moment where I just kind of went, oh, damn it. Uh, And then I went to open the box. I I open it up, and I look inside, and it's absolute chaos. Now, sea urchins, as you may have gathered, can't do a whole lot to cause chaos. (laughs) But these urchins did everything they could to cause chaos. And that's, when the, that's the moment when the swear switched shapes from damn it to oh shit. 
because now I've got a real problem on my hands. And so I'm, I'm looking at the urchins and the first thing I gotta do, you know, I'm a scientist, everything gets broken down into little tiny problems. <laughs> and so I, I sort this out into, into the, the component pieces of the problem. And so over here, I've got urchins that appear to be frozen solid. <laughs> Let's think about that for a second, because these are saltwater creatures with a body cavity that is full of salt water. Salt causes water to freeze at a much lower temperature than a glass of water or like your ice cube tray at home would. So that means that these urchins had to be around 20 to 25 degrees Fahrenheit for an extended period of time. And that's how I found out, that's how I realized that and you know, later shipping data that I looked at, that this box had been sitting in an unheated warehouse in Indianapolis for two days while they waited to get them to me. And, you know, this is a box that says live fish on the side. So, you know, that one's all on FedEx, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we've got some frozen urchins over here. And that's a subcategory of the larger category of spawning urchins. And not just a little bit. Like sometimes they'll come in to me and they'll have like little spots of eggs or sperm on them. That's fine. Now these, I, f I feel like if, if I describe that if I say that these kind of looked like they were covered in Velveeta cheese, then you'd never eat mac and cheese again. So instead, I'll tell you exactly what they look like. It, it's Velveeta cheese. That's exactly what they look like. Um, except for, like, the males are a whiter color and the females are a dark orange. <laughs> and, you know, the, the tops of these urchins are just completely covered in spawn. And the frozen urchins are as well which is extra fun because that means that the spawn on top is frozen into these nice little like ice cubes on top of the urchin. And then after all of that, I see in the bottom of the, of the container, there's two urchins that don't appear to be spawning. They're not frozen. Those are my, my best hope. I, I named them George and Georgina. <laughs> I can't tell them apart. There's no what scientists call sexual dimorphism in sea urchins. They all look pretty much exactly the same. So, you know, George and Georgina, I don't know if I ever switched up their names. I, I assume that it probably happened at least once. Um, now, I said earlier that what I study is the, the embryos of these things. So, on some level, the adult urchins dying wouldn't necessarily be the worst outcome here because I can just collect some eggs and sperm off of them and maybe use that for my experience, experiments. The problem here is that, the, especially with the frozen ones, all of this spawn got way too cold and that, that freezing destroys cells. So basically everything that I have right now is useless. So I've got to clean everybody off and try to save them. Another thing is that the fishery that I got them from was closing for the season. So if, if I couldn't save these urchins, it would be at least a month, possibly two, before I could do any experiments whatsoever. So I've got my situation set up. And another thing that I, I really need to mention right about now is that urchins dying, like the actual physical thing of urchins dying I already said wouldn't necessarily be a problem, but the result of them dying is a problem. The result being that they smell horrendous. Like, you know, everybody's probably like left cheese out too long or like found meat in the back of their freezer that had been there for way too long. And you know, you're a little bit familiar with the smell of like rotting food. That familiarity in no way prepares you for the smell of a dying invertebrate marine animal. See, the, these urchins, um, you know, inside their, their skin, they have what's called a test. It's basically a skeleton. And it's just, it's like a, a, a garlic bulb shape 
where on the bottom, they've just got like a little hole where their mouth protrudes through and the rest of it is pretty much solid. So when they pass away, they start uh, kind of rotting inside that sphere and the smell doesn't get out until you break it. And then it can curl toes in the next time zone. <laughs> so if for no, I mean, these are my, my pets. These are my guys. These are what I do everything with. So even if that wasn't enough for you to want to save these urchins, you don't want to smell them. That, that's really the bottom line. So I've got my setup. And I think I know what I gotta do. I start warming up the frozen urchins with, you know, warm, new seawater, and I'm hoping that I can get them unfrozen. So those guys are over there. The spawning urchins, I think I gotta clean them off, and then I'm putting them in new seawater, I'm giving them a kelp snack, you know, something to feel a little bit better about themselves. <laughs> and then they're going to they're going to sit at their their normal water temperature about 60 degrees fahrenheit and hopefully they'll recover from this george and georgina i've got a lot of hope for them they they're really nice so i'm going to give them special treatment you know they they get the the high end snack some cocktail shrimp <laughs> and they they're getting into nice big tubs of oxygenated new seawater and I'm hoping that, you know, they're not moving too much right now, but that's kind of the normal state of a sea urchin, so hopefully they'll be okay in a few minutes. And so at this point, all I've got to do is monitor the situation and make sure that nothing changes. Well, the first thing that changed is that all of the frozen urchins, they never came back. They, they were dead on arrival. And so after about an hour, I finally was a little bit, I was a little bit sad about it, but, you know, they probably came to me already passed on. And, you know, it, it can be hard to tell when a sea urchin is dead. <laughs> you know, they, they, don't, they don't do a whole lot. But one thing that they will do most of the time is they have a bunch of little tube feet that cover their entire surface. And they use these for walking around on the bottoms of their natural habitat, or in our case, the lobster tank that we keep them in. And these uh, frozen urchins, they never even put out any tube feet. They weren't grabbing onto anything. So I took that as a pretty good sign that they just weren't going to do anything ever again. So the next group were the spawning urchins. Somehow, some way, they started spawning again. <laughs> there, there was a lot of spawn on these things. And they, they apparently still had more, which I had never seen before. So I'm like in full panic mode. This is when the swear changed shape again. And so it, be, it went from the, the shit situation to, oh, fuck. <laughs> Everything is going wrong. So I'm, I'm trying desperately to clean these off because another thing that's, you know, interesting, unless you're in this situation, <laughs> is that when sea urchins come in contact with eggs or sperm, that's a trigger for them to release eggs or sperm. So got to keep cleaning these urchins off and trying to do everything I can to keep them from spawning out. Uh, but over the course of the afternoon and into the evening, like one by one, they just stopped hanging on to the sides of their cups and passing away. So by the time I went home that night, around nine or 10 in the evening, the only two that were left were George and Georgina. I still had hope for them. They hadn't started spawning. They still weren't moving a whole lot, but you know, that's urchins. And so, I, I had pretty good hope for them. Went home that night confident that at least two of my urchins were still going to be okay. The next day I came in, and I opened the door to the lab, and I smell it. 
that, that, that awful, awful smell of invertebrate death. And I, I run over to my tanks, and George and Georgina are sitting in pools of just disgusting purple water. They, they ended up spawning out sometime in the night. I was right that one of them was a male and one of them was a female. <laughs> uh, but they ended up spawning out overnight and dying in their tank and just sitting there all night. It, it was almost enough to make me just turn around, go home, and hope that it was all just a bad dream. But in, in a way, those urchins, even though I lost all 30 of them, they, they still taught me a lot. They taught me about, you know, how to work with these creatures. Because before, you know, the urchins would come in and I'd just put them in their tank and hope that they'd be okay. Suddenly, after this, I was really trying to care for them. You know, when they came in, I was giving them snacks, and I was giving them nice, fresh, clean salt water, and I was washing off the ones that had some spawn on them. And, you know, after that time, for the last year or so, you know, I haven't had another urchin die on me in the same way. So... I really credit those 30 urchins with, <laughs> with giving me the experience and the knowledge to not let that happen again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was Adam Foote. Adam recently graduated with a master's degree in biology from Carnegie Mellon University, and he is very grateful to his sea urchin friends for getting him there. His first memory of science is when he took a long bath after a day in the woods and wondered why his fingers prune up. When he is not explaining science to both willing and unwilling audiences, Adam enjoys cooking, which is chemistry for hungry people, and playing music, which is physics for the ears. Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, Ari Daniel, Christine Gentry, Skylar Bear, and Liz Neely. The podcast is produced by Rose Avalith. And it's a lot from Brooke Williams, Lana Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to the Rex Theater for hosting the show, to the Public Communications for Researchers Group at Carnegie Mellon University for being amazing partners, and to the holidays for being a great time to catch up on work. Thanks for listening. When we made our McDonald's spicy chicken McNuggets, you were praise hands emoji. Then we ran out, and you were streaming tears emoji. Now they're back, so you can be grinning face with sweat emoji. Order ahead on the McDonald's app. And get money mouth face emoji with two orders of crispy, irresistible 10-piece McNuggets, spicy or classic, for just $6. Limited time only. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. ba 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 ba